Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. All right, and welcome to a little look at Morkborg with a uh, Ferratory Supplement and the Solitary Defilement um, solo rules for Morkborg. So last night we played our first session of Morkborg and we played it as a cooperative RPG. There was no GM. We all took turns kind of being GM for each other. We took turns uh, running different NPCs for each other, uh, rolling on different charts and coming up with things that we wanted to experience in the game. And we mainly used the Solitary Defilement solo rules to facilitate that kind of game. And it was a resounding success. It was so much fun. It was one of the most fun um, RPG sessions I have had in a very long time. I played with two other guys. And um, I think a lot of that has to do with just how simple Morkborg is, how good the rules are for solitary defilement, the solo rules, and how easily those can translate into playing a game like this cooperatively with other players. And also, that also has a lot to do with the uh, supplemental uh, material in the Ferratory, in addition to just creating the right atmosphere and mood. So usually when we play, when I play uh, games with a group, we're usually in my kitchen where there isn't really a lot of atmosphere, kind of on a larger table. We have more room and um, things are more spread out. But what I wanted to do is just create the right atmosphere for, uh, for Morkborg. And so I... I turned my my table in my hobby room uh, kind of like sideways, a different rotation, different orientation than it usually is. And uh, we all three of us like were pretty cramped in my little hobby room with just a couple little lights on. And that was really a smart move for this game because we were playing on such a small table when we were looking through the book. Everybody was able to look at the text, look at the design, and look at the art. And just everybody had a more intimate connection to the art and theme of the game. If you remember in my review for Super Blood Harvest, or my look at Super Blood Harvest, I should say, I questioned whether or not I was going to be buying any more of these artistic RPGs. And at that point, I was kind of against them. And just because it's usually only the game master who gets to participate in the fun of looking at all of the art and the book itself, which is part of the game. But when we're playing on a small table and we are playing cooperatively, where we're all kind of sharing the book and looking at it, it just made it for a much more enjoyable experience so that everybody was able to really absorb the things that make this game unique and the things that make it cool. Another thing we did, of course, was put together a playlist of uh, appropriate music. And our playlist for last night so far, it consists of um, Agalox, The Mantle, um, The Runes of Beverest, The Thule Grimoires, so... Uh, the Ruins of Beverest are one of my favorite bands. I just discovered these guys last year. A friend hooked me um, A friend hit me to them. And man, this Thule of Grimoires is an amazing album. Uh, we had tracks from Bellwitch and Aerial Ruins, uh, The Stygian Bow, Volume 1. Uh, Emma Ruth Arundel and Vows, uh, May Our Chambers Be Full. Death White's Grave Image. Uh, Death White has a new album coming out next month. I'm really excited for that. Imperium's Uber Den Sternen, which was my number one album last year, I believe, or my number two. It was in my top five. I can't remember, but yeah, fantastic album. And then Uv's songs, uh, The Hunt. So I'll put links to like some of those songs in the description of this video. But it was just really important to set the right mood especially for a game like this. So one of... Um, Besides the art, besides the theme, besides just the just the great kind of atmosphere and and weirdness that Morkborg offers, another thing that is really cool about the game is it is super simple. Most of the core rules do fit on one sheet of paper. 
And because it's so easy, it is, or because the rules are so light, it is super easy to incorporate a whole bunch of other things. And with their third party licensing agreement where anybody can just create cool stuff for the game, it's really opened up just this complete treasure trove of awesome things for the game. And one of those awesome things is Solitary Defilement. So Solitary Defilement is a collection of solo rules designed especially for Morkborg. And it was kickstarted, but you can also get the PDFs on DriveThruRPG for, for uh, a, a really good price, I believe. If they're not free, they're, they're, it doesn't cost very much. And those come with the normal rules for Solitary Defilement. So it says no prior RPG knowledge required. The Morkborg Core Book and Ferratory, or alternatively, a handful of free Morkborg Cult digital downloads are all you need to get started. Oh, and a willingness to die. So this is a solitary defilement, includes a series of moves tailored to Morkborg solo play, introductory oracles to move your story forward, rules for travel and dungeon crawling, and the extended gameplay example to introduce the concept. And then you get a whole book that adds um, Alone in the Crowd, which is an entire book on having city crawls. So all kinds of different ways you can have urban adventures in the world of Morkborg. You get three, and you also get three little adventures, little dungeon crawls, Shadow Clink, Park Pale, and Aqua Mortis. So our game last night, we played through Shadow Clink because I thought it would be a really cool way to start the to uh, start our campaign. And uh, we started as prisoners who were captured, and we had to escape and get our gear back. And we came out into the overworld, and now we can really kick off our campaign um, in, in, in proper fashion. So uh, Morkborg is a super simple rules light game. It uses a D20 system. You have four stats uh, for strength, agility, presence, and toughness. Those also double or triple, or those also basically become your skills. So any skill that might be associated with strength, you use your strength bonus. And uh, same goes for agility and presence and then toughness. And then there also is an additional uh, stat that is also a currency called omens. And in the solitary rules, you use your omens as kind of a luck stat. And like I said, also it is also a currency that you can spend to basically help your character survive by rerolling dice and that kind of thing. So our characters that we made, uh, I am called Skag. Um, I am a bug eater. I uh, earned an iron stomach feat so I can eat rotten food with a toughness of a, of a, of a six. Um, I have a flesh hook that I found in a, in, in a torture chamber that does D6 damage. I also started with a staff. I found some heavy armor of Ventus and I have some lard, which I can use for food. Um, I found uh, two bottles of snuff that made me go into a berserker rage when I used it. And I got the Blood of Serpents, which the Blood of Serpents is from this really cool supplement in here. So this is Ferratory. And Ferratory is a collection of fan-made supplements that has been officially um, made cool looking <laughs> via the uh, folks at, 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 at the Mark Board game. And so then they released this really nice collection of cool supplemental rules for big like overland traveling, lots of charts that you can roll on for overland traveling. And these are easily adaptable and really needed for the solitary defilement rules. You have um, rules for hunting prey so you can get food and all kinds of different things that can help you on a hunt and different creatures, monsters that you can hunt depending on where you are in the world. I love this. It's almost like a Monster Hunter style game. And then you get the Death Ziggurat, which is a, uh, a hex crawl. I'm not quite sure how good this will translate to solo or co-op play. But, so I haven't really read through that yet. But it does come with some cool monsters and NPCs that you can use. Um, another little adventure called the Goblin Grinder. Um, D100 items and tr trinkets. All kinds of weird little things like... Uh, a blood drill, a book of psalms, a box of black feathers, two eyes in a jar. So all kinds of weird, cool little things. 
uh, the Goblin Grinder, which is another little uh, little scenario that has a shop, has a little town, and then it has a little dungeon crawl that you can go through. Uh, the Tenebrous Reliquary. This is where I got that blood serpent. So this is like 100. Is it 100 or D66? It is D66 items and a really, really cool stuff like different kinds of daggers, a stone a magnet, a tyrant's tongue, a uh, faux hammer, zodiac lung. A zodiac lung. What is that? Uh, pressing this blackened organ to the chest absorbs it, leaving fetid scars and postules. When absorbed, the user may breathe underwater, provided it's unclean. After an hour of submersion, the user may expunge the filth as writhing sludge, dealing D4 damage to the closest targets. Okay, so yeah, as you can see, really <laughs> unique items in this chart here. Uh, some rules for having uh, uh, inns for like menus and things you can order at an inn. And then it comes with a couple classes, a cursed skinwalker, a pale one, god, a dead god's prophet, and a forlorn philosopher. So all kinds of really awesome things in there. Um, but anyways, uh, back to my character. So uh, the, the rules are pretty simple. It's a really simple D20 system. The stats, you only use the bonus. You don't do what you, you don't, um, you don't care about what you roll to get that bonus. You just use the bonus. And then everything you're trying to do is through a difficulty rating. Uh, normal is like 12. So you would roll a D20 and you want to get 12 adding or subtracting any bonuses. And the solitary defilement rules, what that does is it adds a weak hit strong hit uh, miss situation where you roll two d20s for all of your checks except for combat and if both dice pass that is a strong hit so things go totally according to plan if you roll a weak hit then it's a partial success so you succeed but something happens and so that gives you a chance to role play a chance to come up with a twist you know a yes but a yes and and then if both dice are a failure, well, then you fail at your uh, you fail at what you're trying to do and then you can uh, role play from there. And so the basic solo rules, which are added on top of the normal easy rules, they add what is called a series of moves. And it was pretty much based on and inspired by Iron Sworn, which I still haven't played. It's coming with the next Kickstarter. So really looking forward to that. But you have a whole bunch of different moves, and these are kind of like how you take turns playing as a solo RPG. And what we did is we just took turns making moves as a cooperative group. As a group, we were playing our heroes or our scum. Uh, we were, uh, you can begin an adventure, you can complete a milestone, conclude an adventure. So this is kind of how you start and end your adventures. Milestones, when you complete a milestone, that's kind of how you would level up. You have a general adventuring move, a gam. Uh, this is just kind of anything you want to do while you are on a quest. You know, climb a rock, uh, climb a tree, uh, dig a pit, uh, you know, jump a, cr uh, a pit, that kind of stuff. You can flee from combat, search for an object, camping, resting, and catching your breath. Um, undertake a journey. That's how you go on overland crawls. And the overland crawls, you would come back to this territory and you would use this map to figure out how many days you need to travel. And then you could roll for random events and random things that are going to happen to you on your travels. You have a dungeon crawl journey. And so that's what we did here. The, the dungeon crawl rules for um, solo defilement are really simple. Most of the dungeons have four special rooms. And what you're doing is you are trying to find all four of the special rooms when you go on a dungeon crawl. And the fourth special room you find is your objective room. So that's where your boss would be or the thing you are looking for. And as you are playing, as you are going through the dungeon, um, it becomes easier and easier as you're progressing to find your special room. There are also um, normal rooms, which normal rooms you would use one of the oracles in here to kind of generate what the room is, how it smells, maybe how it tastes, uh, and what is in the room. And the last uh, move you can do is retire from adventure. Ha ha, come on, be serious. So the Oracle system used in Solitary Defilement, this is a really, really great collection of Oracles. 
It incorporates things from Ferratory. It incorporates uh, the different charts and stuff from the core rulebook, as well as a number of um, unique charts to Solitary Defilement. So you have a bestiary here, uh, creatures that are found in the three books, uh, different regions that you can explore, which is from a chart in um, here. So you have these different regions and different adventure hooks. So you can easily on this page here, you could easily roll up an adventure hook to get a campaign started. You can use this page here in the core rulebook to kind of uh, populate uh, some dungeon features, or you can use the um, dungeon room description that charts here to roll. Um, you know, maybe you have found a a bleak. Or blasted. Um, where's my D12 at? A bleak or blasted um, prison cell, stable or zoo. So you found a bleak prison, and then you can roll on how many uh, exits there are from that room, and then you can uh, roll for any room contents that you might find. So you might find uh, two, the remains of something, a structure, object. A once living thing. Okay, so maybe uh, we don't know what that structure is. We can look up for the materials. Uh, what is it made out of? What kind of uh, structure is it? It is, um, it's blackened. Okay, it's blackened. It is uh, made out of blackened earth. Okay, so that's kind of gross. Uh, does it emanate a sound? Or maybe it has an odor. Um, blackened earth structure that is um, it's fermented. So it's some kind of like organic structure that we have found. And so you're going to be rolling on charts. You're going to be populating your dungeon rooms. And then every single one of these rolls, you know, gives the players a, a, a chance to, to role play, a chance to add interesting things that they want. So you have all these prompts. And then when you're working together as a group at the table, you can come up with a lot of really interesting scenarios and taking turns so you can roll up different um, religious, different cults, different building structures, uh, different kinds of NPCs. So we could use this chart to come up with some neat prompts so we could role play RPG. Um, we could role play NPCs and we would just take turns, each being an NPC and having little conversation, conversations with the other two members of the group. And just it worked so well. I was so happy. I, I've never run a GM led uh, RPG as a cooperative game before. And to tell you the truth, I don't know if I ever want to go back to playing an RPG just with a GM and players. I liked all of us being involved in all aspects of the game. It kept all three of us really engaged in the experience. And because we were all giving our input on the story and our characters and our backstory, it just became a really an interesting, uh, just an interesting night of fun times. Uh, my other uh, friend here is uh, Kinashok, I think. King Shock. King Shook. And um, he has a sword and a, um, he got this brand, this torturer's brand that when he hits somebody with it, it causes them to, uh, it, it makes it easier to hit on the next turn. But the main star of the character was my buddy's uh, uh, heretical priest. He decided to play a different class, a heretical priest named Ul. And this guy kind of became like a god. Uh, in the jail cell that we were in, the first thing that happened was he found this power. And powers in Morkborg are like spells and they're written on scrolls. And they are insanely powerful. And because the game is so rules light, it really gives you a lot of freedom to make things as weak or as powerful or as dangerous or as mysterious as you want them to be. So he found scrawled on a wall in graffiti the writings for a spell called the Enochian Syntax. And this is the power. This is all it says. One creature blindly obeys a single command. Okay, that is insanely powerful. So he was just telling people to kill themselves left and right. You know, you, you can only use your powers a certain uh, number of times per day. And if you fail, they do damage to you. And when you do uh, fail 
a certain way, you are going to have to roll on this um, arcane catastrophe chart, which are very, very bad things can happen to you. But um, it was just so much fun. And then in a pile of dead uh, corpses, he found this evil eye, which like, which was an eyeball that could replace one of his other eyes. So like he ripped out one of his eyes and shoved in this evil eye, which automatically damages um, monsters <laughs> or, or combatants at the start of combat. And he also found another power called Whispers Past the Gate, which he can ask questions to any deceased creature. So this heretical priest uh, kind of became like this almost like a godlike figure in our game. And so me and my, my other buddy, we're kind of like following this guy because we're kind of scared of him while we're also in awe of him. And our backstory is that um, King Shook was... Um, he has a uh, he he was involved in a scheme that we were following him on and he kind of duped us out of some money so he owes us some money and so we are making sure that he doesn't get too far out of our sight so we can get paid but as the adventure went on we realized that maybe this guy Ool here is actually kind of the most important character in our party and uh, we need to follow him. He wants to get back to maybe one of his temples or a shrine, or maybe he wants to go and defile a temple or something. I don't know. We haven't quite figured out what the overall narrative arc of our campaign is. And that's okay, because uh, we can do that together as a group, make it as interesting and as fun and as uh, dark or as lighthearted or goofy or weird as we want. And the dungeon crawl that we went on, let's see if I can find. So this is our dungeon crawl sheet here. Uh, we started in the cell and we passed through our rooms. Uh, we found this, the most, I think the most interesting room we found was this infested shrine. And we walked into the room and we saw a, 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 this like grimy uh, NPC in there. He was a retainer and we thought he was like cleaning the shrine. But actually the way we role played it is he was actually defiling the shrine with crap. And he had started this like cult that was all around this uh, this this fecal matter cult, basically in the sewers. And he was hoping people would join his cult, but he started it in the sewers, so nobody was down there. And we pretended that we were interested in joining his cult. And he asked us to uh, help him defile his infested <laughs> shrine. And then he gave us um, some tips and stuff on how to get through this adventure. So really cool um if you've never played a gm led rpg as a co-op game i highly recommend doing it trying it out getting either these uh solitary defilement solo rules which i think could pretty easily be adapted to uh, other games or uh simply using my favorite you know um Scarlet Heroes. Scarlet Heroes could easily be played as a cooperative RPG. And maybe after we uh, finish our campaign here, maybe we're going to do that. One thing that I also do like about Merkborg is the campaigns are finite. Um, a big part of this game is that the world is going to end. It's just a matter of time. So as you are playing every day, you roll on this calendar. And if you roll enough ones in a row... Then the world ends. Certain ill omens come uh, to fruition and, and the apocalypse happens and it's the end of the world. And that campaign is over. Those characters are dead. And then you can easily roll up another one. So it's kind of like a almost like a long term roguelike in a way, because you know that these characters are going to die. It's just a matter of when they die and what can we do in this world before the apocalypse happens. So yeah, that was kind of a weird sprawling look at uh, Morkborg with the Feratory Supplement with Solitary Defilement. I do plan on doing a solo um, session, a couple solo ses sessions on the channel because I'm really into this game right now, especially with these supplements. And there's so much stuff online. It's almost overwhelming the amount of things that are available for this game because of their really liberal third-party licensing program. Um, their plan, it makes it really easy to, to find, make, and create cool stuff for this game. So yeah, pay attention to the Dungeon Dive for uh, more Morkborg stuff. 
I just kind of wanted to do this big kind of sprawling video now here uh, talking about how we played it and if you, and, and encouraging people to to play their RPGs in a more of a co-op fashion. And if you've ever done that with other games and other systems, uh, please let me know because I would be interested in uh, in doing this with other games. So, all right, guys, we'll take it easy. We'll talk to you later. Bye bye.